Knockback, the retro and nostalgia podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Knockback. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined, as always, by my brother, Dagan Moriarty of the Deadly Viper Assassination Squad. Dagan, thank you for joining me today. How are you? The sixth member. The sixth member. Look at th- Whoa. Watch out. Watch out. A little sure judo, taekwondo, glasses. tempo, kempo. Ta- I'm sorry. It's kempo, <laughs> taekwondo. That's what I took when I was a kid. Yeah, I, I want to talk to that. I, I, I want to talk to that in the episode. I have to, I have to pick your brain about various martial arts i'm realizing my glasses are on my glasses are reserved for work not the podcast now kyle i do have this delicious cup of coffee though yeah which i usually don't do the coffee thing during the pod Hmm. but i was just you know i don't even know if you realize as a non-coffee drinker yourself how how vital is that in the shot yeah there it is I love dad. Yeah. Does that mean I love dad? Does that? Yeah. Mean that, yeah. That's what I was, was going to say. That that's pretty ambiguous. Right. I don't know. Could mean everything. They right. love dad. I love dad. Who knows? Someone loves. Someone loves dad. Someone loves a dad, <laughs> which is nice. I have to yeah. I'm not. A, I'm not a coffee guy. I I don't mind it. When I used to go to restaurants, which I really don't do anymore, but I used to really go to restaurants all the time. Yeah. I used to drink espresso or a an Irish coffee, like with dessert. Oh, but dessert. Was, okay. I was going to say that was with about the meal. Yeah, no, no, that was about it. Because I would always drink an old fashioned or three or four of those with with the meal. With so, the meal. A little liquor with your meal. I, right. I, but I, I do drink I, do. A, I do drink a can of Pepsi every day. And I wonder if there is some sort of caffeine thing in there somewhere. Just I like one my can? Pepsi. Just one can. Sometimes two, but okay. if I pour the second glass, I usually dump most of it out. It's because I just want like a little bit more. You know? Okay. Okay. Cause I just do my little you know, I like but I I, I feel like a Coke or a Pepsi with a meal is like that's my shit. Oh, you know, it's so crazy that that's what you're talking about, because that's what I was just thinking. I was brew. I, I text you, give me a couple extra minutes. I just want to brew a cup of coffee downstairs. And I'm thinking as I'm fixing, I don't know why. Uh, maybe I've even mentioned this during the podcast before, but like, I feel like you go out to eat with dad, right? Especially to the diner. We talked about this before, I think. Mm. He gets a cup of coffee with his meal. He'll get like a big salad, like a chef salad or whatever right. he gets, a burger, whatever he gets. He's always got the cup of coffee, which I always growing up as a kid, especially thought it was very strange. It's like, how are you going to go to the diner and get like this all American meal, a burger, whatever, chicken sandwich, and then tuna, whatever, even breakfast, right? How are you not going to get the fountain soda, right? It's like he gets the cup of coffee, especially with dinner. I always found it odd. But then I crossed that that age, I think, gap where I was like, then I started doing it. It's like I get I would get the burger or the patty melt, whatever, and then it had to had to be the cup of coffee alongside that. And then I was then I realized like that's probably the mark of getting to be old. Right. So if you're doing that out there, and I don't mean to call you guys and girls old, but if you're getting a cup of coffee with your meal that really is like more appropriate for a beverage or like a soft drink. Yeah, you're, you're old. getting pretty old. Well, because I always, old. I always say that my my classic old person or the classic old person McDonald's meal is the hamburger, not a cheeseburger, a hamburger, a small fry, and a small coffee. That's like you know, like the that's like the the eighty year old in the corner meal. <laughs> that really, is. you know, hamburger and the white wrapper, not the yellow wrapper. Small fry in the paper. The white the, the wrapper. Paper. And I feel then like nobody gets coffee. that. Yeah. You're absolutely correct. By yeah. the way, what happened with McDonald's with breakfast all day? They don't do they it stopped. anymore, you mean? No, oh, they, they stopped? stopped. I think they stopped during COVID at some point because mm. it was just too much. I guess COVID being just too much in general is like breakfast all day is like a, we, we could barely do this during non-COVID. Like, right, right, right. We were barely hanging on. So I remember like going – like it was so nice. Like you could go like – you know, you always had that thing, like, look at the watch. Like, it's 1045. I'm never going to make it there. Right, right. Like, and you never really know if you're going to get there in time or if you're going to annoy them. I and they're that. not yeah. trying. And they were not trying to go over that line, that time limit, right? Definitely So not. you want your Egg McMuffin, then you couldn't get it. So it was like, oh, 2 o'clock, you'd roll in, get the Egg McMuffin. Always a little bit of an attitude, I felt like. 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, Egg McMuffin. 7 o'clock p.m. Egg McMuffin. They weren't. They would do it. They weren't happy about it. And they want to, and I think they wanted to make sure you knew they weren't really quite happy about it. Like we put that away for the day. Like we have a McDonald's here, Kyle. I'm going off on a tangent, but who cares? No, it's all good. We have a McDonald's here, our local McDonald's. Yeah, I know. They do this thing where 
And it's definitely a thing. Like I've experienced this enough times now to know this is unmistakable. If you go past like 8.30 at night, the milkshake machine is broken. It's not broken. They just cleaned it ahead of time. Because this is like a, the it's like a meme, there. right? Isn't that like a meme online? Is that a thing? I think I think you should look into this. That the ice cream machines in McDonald's are always broken. Like, you should look into this. I think this might be something. I don't it really know how to. It gets to the point where it. I go to McDonald's after eight thirty, and if I'm so psyched if they say I could get a milkshake after eight eight thirty, you know, eight forty five, whatever. Because I know I and I feel like saying, look, I know you, I know you, that's not true. And I know you're not going to give it to me, but I just want you to know, I know that that's that. Right, it's right. not broken. I know, you, you know, know I mean? that I know. Right. <laughs> and that's what's important. I, I totally understand. I, I must say, I don't know if I've remarked this, but Mike and I talk about this a lot because we go to McDonald's maybe once a week or once every 10 days or something. But okay. there's a, there's a McDonald's um, near our house that I would argue is maybe the best McDonald's I've ever been in. I've really? never actually what been in, but it's... been to, it is just, you know, like we've talked about this on the show. But yeah. after, when you start going to repeated specific restaurants, like specific fast food restaurants, you sure. start to realize if they're like a good representation of that restaurant or not. And we've talked about the scale of scarcity, right? And in, in finding the proper restaurant, like yeah. the Burger King in Dover, New Hampshire, when I was a kid was the Burger King that I've been into. That was like I a real Burger one. King. And I feel like the McDonald's on Hull Street in Chesterfield is the McDonald's that I've been to where, first of all, it's always packed. They have like the two lines going, okay. right? Like, and the fries are always hot. The food is always good. The orders are always right. They're kind and nice. And it's interesting because McDonald's, it does taste the same everywhere. But if you go to the McDonald's in JFK, you're going to have a very different experience than if you go to the McDonald's down here. Absolutely. In Chesterfield. So, right, right. So I just, I've been really enamored with this idea of, uh, continuing on the idea of like the perfect iteration of the restaurant and how that I've been in, there are specifically Wendy's and, and Burger Kings. I can think of where I'm like, it makes me want to throw up thinking about these places. <laughs> I can think of a few of those too, actually. In Santa Monica, there was a Wendy's that was disgusting. There was a couple Burger Kings in San Francisco that were disgusting. Everything's disgusting in San Francisco. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's so uh, funny. Yeah. You remind me of the Burger King down in Manhattan, the South Street Seaport, downtown, very touristy area, gorgeous part of the city, right? Just horrifyingly awful Burger King. Like you would think it would be play up a little more to the touristy, you know, right by the fish market and everything. Oh, dude, it's so, yeah. So that that definitely strikes a chord. Burger King is too sophisticated to go to a bad Burger King. Like, I don't mean this in any ironic way. It is not, it's a flame broiled thing on like a, a belt. It just seems like it's a little more thoughtful, right, of a, of a, of a, yeah. a than the McDonald's thing. And so yes. I think it requires a little more attention. But when you and the toppings are known to be fresh, like the Fresher, Whopper, yeah. there's like yeah. no corollary of the Whopper. The Whopper is awesome. But if you get a bad Whopper, mm. it is so risky to order a Whopper. I agree. And that's where I can't um, I can't abide by that. So when I find the place that I like. Yeah. I just keep going to it over and over and over again because yeah. it's too it's too risky to to go out there because I'm too I eat once a day if I have a bad go at it I either have to break my fast which is fine I break fast like once a week or so or yeah because I have to you really should or you have to just kind of be like oh this meal sucked this is a waste of calories I really do look at it like that so I just start going to the same there's this barbecue place we keep going to down here now getting it delivered on DoorDash and we're like obsessed oh, with nice. it because it's another similar thing where it is so good. You can is it a chain? Which one? It's a small chain. Q Barbecue, it's called. Okay, it, there's yeah. one by mom and one by me, actually. Okay. Which is funny. Yeah. Nice, dude. Yeah. yeah so and you, you know down, what? You that also it. gets into other things too. Like, do you go to Bur you're, you're craving the Whopper? Do you go to Burger King late night, like graveyard shift, like disgruntled? Like they don't want to work that shift. Well, maybe they do. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to pigeonhole anybody, but. That's another thing too. Like you go to Burger King, like you're saying, like a busy fast food chain at a certain hour, they got, it's a well-oiled machine. They got all the little league soccer moms, whatever, coming in at a certain time around dinner after school, but before it's too late, you know, you have that whole thing, but then maybe you go five hours later. Is it going to be the same, the same thing? Maybe they're not as prepared. They think they don't have to make a certain thing at a certain, like who's going to get a filet of fish at 1130. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I totally understand all kinds of iterations. I mean, this is a whole topic. And this gets back full circle to your query about where breakfast went. Ironically, where did breakfast go? Oh my God. So I need well, my egg McMuffins and I'm not trying to go there too early. 
I totally understand that. I, I was starting to do some weird shit with the breakfast at McDonald's, you know, like starting to get starting to get a little crazy with the combinations, which probably also wasn't wasn't thrilling to them. Um, well, nothing really interesting in my my life going on. Yeah, I was going to ask what's happening this week. I I have a sm- I'm building a small group of people around me, not people around me, but people I'm working with that I actually like, like uh, in, around my house, I, like the guy that did my landscaping, not my landscaper because I do my own like mowing, but the guy you that mow, like yeah. did the landscaping and then okay. the person that's now keeping up the landscaping and all of this. OK. okay. And, uh, you know, I'm finding a good rhythm with some of these people, but I wonder if they find me annoying sometimes because I I, uh, I don't think they do, but I I have a really good rapport with some of these people. And one of the people is no, known as doctor something or whatever, because it was a long care service, Oh, okay, and, but he has like a PhD of whatever he does. Oh, shit. and um, so I've been referring to him as the other to the other landscaper as the good doctor. <laughs> That's amazing. That's a bit like straight faced. Like, you're yeah, not like even I'm like, like the good doctor says that, uh, you know, he was, I said, I think I said something like the good doctor is very complimentary of your work. Yeah. I'll say this. If this guy that you're talking to gets you, this is the kind of guy you want in your life. If yeah. like if he thinks that's funny, even maybe to a level of like knowing you're being funny, appreciating it, but not really kind of being on the same wavelength of not acknowledging that you're being funny. So he's just as funny. You stay with that guy. That's that's he's he's of your tribe. You know what I mean? Definitely. Yeah, I so, totally agree. I totally agree. Like I found really some bad companies down here, but some really good ones, too. So I want to give a, a a quick shout out to, well, I said before, like the first company I worked here that I really liked and had like a good relationship with was Richmond Security. They were awesome. Um, okay. That's they were like really the, nice uh... people. And uh, they're like a private security company that like does, you know, security setups. Not yeah, like that's your, cool. Your ring. So I did that with them. And then, yeah, this, uh, this landscaping company called Hudgens down here. Really nice okay. people. Really nice people. You know, family run. And uh, now I'm doing my long care with Dr. Vaughn, the good doctor. Do- the good doctor. Dude, let that's, me ask you this. Yeah, Dr. Vaughn, the good doctor. You and I think I know the answer to this, but you and Mike, uh, do you have a ha- uh, somebody to come in and clean your house every three weeks, every month? Whatever? No, no, no. I, I clean the house. You guys clean. Okay. Because yeah. I was going to ask how your rapport was no, with them. I can't, <laughs> we can't. We haven't gotten the house cleaned in a while. We've been trying yeah. to do it. But we like to do, I mean, in a, in a perfect world, it's nice if you get someone in every three weeks. We're busy. You know what I mean? Type of thing. We're fortunate in that, you know, enough to be able to do that sometimes. And but I can't, they all have the same rhythm. They come, they sell themselves. It's, you know, it's very like, um, they set the bar very high. They right. come the first two or three times, awesome job. And then it starts to get, you know, like worse, worse right, and right, right, worse. Right. And it's like, they missed this whole spot where, to the point where it's like, they didn't even vacuum half this carpet. Like it gets like every time. Right. So we can't find someone who's consistent. But at the same time, I don't want to be a nudge because I ever tell you that we're not, we got to get into the topic, but. There's my friend that I work with in, in, in the animation world in New York has this horrific story. He had a cleaning lady and I could see this because this guy, I love him, but he could be a bit of a ball buster. He pissed off the cleaning lady so bad that he had this like blockage in his pipes, like his toilets wouldn't flush, his sinks were backing up all at the same time. And he, he couldn't realize what it was. Finally found out, went into the basement. He's kind of a handy guy, went into the basement and figured out, dude, they had been flushing the, the cleaning people had been flushing washcloths down his <laughs> toilet. And he said he opened up the, like the main and just a clump of washcloths fell out. It were blo- because they were being, they were pissed and they were, that, that was their little dig of being vindictive and saying, fuck you. So I'm, I always think of that story because I'm always like, I don't want to be like, you know, come here. Like, Sometimes there's a language barrier. We had Polish people, then we had some nice Ecuadorian people, but they don't speak great English oftentimes. Right. So you want to, and you want to be making sure you're not being bossy. You're trying to be sensitive. Like, okay, look, like maybe hit this, you know, dust this, so, you know, don't forget to hit this piece, you know, what type of thing. But mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm mortified. So we just let them go, you know, and then yeah. we get the next one in and it's the same pattern. Yeah. You gotta, over. you gotta nip it in the bud. Nip it yeah. in the bud is one thing. It's hard. It's hard to do. It's hard to do. But here's the thing with cleaning people. First of all, dad had Polish cleaning people too. And I wonder if like a lot of Polish immigrants fall into that line of work. Nice That's people. Yeah. They were, they were great. Yeah. We had a Polish. They were also like, please don't give us checks. Like, <laughs> oh yeah. I'm sure. Please God. 
<laughs> we um, can't do the check thing. This cash. Yeah, no, I, I, I've been, dude, that was like my landlord in San Francisco. We were paying him in fucking <laughs> cash. Greg and I used to pay him in person together just in case he ever tried to act like we didn't pay him. There was like a wind purpose to take a picture with the cell phone. Well, like, it was just like both of us would Filming go together. It. it was everyone knew he knew that's why we were going together. We were giving Smart. him the cash and we would give him a thousand dollar check because that was like his like, yeah, I, I charge a thousand dollars for this apartment. And then I'm like, here's two thousand dollars in cash or more than that. You know, it's like, wow. Yeah. So um, it would be two versus one. If there Johnson, was ever some sort son of, of a argument. bitch. Yeah, he was. I liked him a lot. Actually, he was just a curmudgeonly old Chinese man. But oh, um, but I I'm slowly turning into a curmudgeonly old Chinese man myself. So it's no there's no. <laughs> Yes, you are. He was like a great. He actually, Johnson was probably one of the great influences on my life. Like that guy was, that guy was mean with tea. And his name was Johnson Ho. That was his name. That's amazing. It's the best uh, name ever. He lived upstairs. He owned the building. He was a really nice old man. He he, actually, it's kind of sad because right when I moved in with Bromley, which is how I moved into that place, his wife had just died. I met his wife when I when I got permission to move in. I met her, and then that was it. And she so I was catching him at a bad time. Uh, Oh yeah, no no doubt about that. But, we nice old, but I lived, that. but I lived there for like seven years or something like that. And we slowly grew to have like a rapport and I'd like take the garbage out for him and all this kind of stuff. But okay. he had, I think I said this story, or whatever, it's totally non sequitur, but he was like the guy that had the random Russian man living in the garage. Like the entire time I lived in this building, there was just like a, an illegal in-law, which was were all over San Francisco built into the garage. And it was just like a closet basically with like a stall shower and a bed. And it was just this random Russian dude that lived there. And we called wow. him the Russian. We had no idea who he was. We referred to him as the Russian. Wow. And he lived there before I moved in. He was there when I left. And I uh, if he was like KGB, like who knows? Covert. That's right. That's that's cool of me, right? Like Russian automatically. He's KGB. Yeah. Like, all automatically, yeah. With, he, cool Johnson's thing, Johnson. Maybe he was in the seat. Maybe he was a fucking card carrying communist. They didn't want you to say it. Not Johnson. Oh, no, he was one of us. No, he was. So anyway, I don't know what we're talking about. Let's get into the <laughs> the topic at hand, Dagan. <laughs> it's Kill Bill Volume One, the 2003 Quentin Tarantino classic film. Supposed to be one film, but ends up being split into two. Obviously, the next one comes out the following year mm-hmm. starring Uma Thurman. I hadn't seen this movie in a long time. I think I saw this movie when it came out, and that was probably it. In the beginning of it, it I, I, I remarked to Micah because we were watching it together. She had never seen it. I was like, I think I already know why I really didn't care for this movie yeah. because it's so combat oriented. And as we say over and over again, I'm like, I'm just not into the combat thing. But the way the movie starts is quite deceiving because in getting through that Vivica Fox scene, it actually turned it kind of reminded me of Scream a little bit, actually, in a weird way, where Scream has that Drew Barrymore scene in the beginning that's just totally severed from the rest of the film. Yes, that's and right. And it's just like Drew Barrymore in the first 10 or 15 minutes and that's it. And then and then it goes into the what the movie actually is. Remind me a little bit of that structure. And what I ended up finding was a quite a pleasant movie that's fun to watch. Doesn't really make any sense, mostly because we don't have the whole story. Classic Tarantino and two thoughts that I wanted to bounce off of you as I throw it over to you. The first is and I wrote this down. This is exactly what I say. I say it's a video game movie without the video game license. That's number one. So this movie feels like a video game. I know that he probably wasn't inspired by them. I assume he was inspired by Westerns like he always is, maybe comic books and stuff like that. But this to me is a video game movie without being based on a video game. And I really like that aspect of it. And the second part is that even though this movie is so obviously inspired by a bunch of things that I don't understand because I'm not a film guy, I feel like I know Tarantino's body of work well enough. In fact, I think I've seen all of his movies now, except for Kill Bill Volume 2, which we'll talk about that. His style, though it borrows from so many others, isn't of itself its own style. And I know that a lot of people that know more about film watch this movie and are like, oh, man, look at the Kurosawa or look at whatever, whatever sure, he's being sure, inspired by. But yeah. to me, I'm like, look at the Tarantino. You know, like that's. That to me, it's like the the combination of avant garde structure and violence sudden violence which is his calling card which i love when things become violent out of nowhere which is always really fun um so there's a lot to say about this film and i'm curious why you wanted to choose it it was one of your choices and also what you think of it what your experience with it was back in the day and um how you feel about it today tarantino's film four yeah that's right it is his fourth film you Mm -hmm. know he's he had other things in there four rooms i think from dusk till dawn um what else? Well, he, he calls it his natural fourth born film, right? killers, which he was a part of. 
yeah, but he calls it wasn't this his, his projects. Right. They, right. He calls this in the credits his fourth film, I think. Yeah, no, it is yeah. actually his fourth film that he wrote, directed, co-created and all that kind of stuff, although he was a part of other things. So interesting, so interesting to think it was 2003 and 2004 with part two and that it was only his fourth film. And he had made such a huge name for himself already in Hollywood and just as a household name, you know, just like a pop culture icon already. I love what you said, first of all, about it being a video game, because this is very appropriate for a video game. It's the perfect model for what a good game would be, right? You have a hero that you could get behind, a revenge story. I would argue a very justified revenge story, um, very skillful, martial arts based and vastly outnumbered by the bad guys. So it's like a perfect boss battles, right? It's like a perfect model for a video game. And I love what you said too about Quentin Tarantino sort of being like this, a lot like Kevin Smith, oddly enough, just like Kevin Smith on a higher level, like sort of works from his influences and his influences are so unapologetic and embedded in what he does. It's sort of a pastiche of everything he loves as a film buff, especially like, you know, French New Wave, all the genres, spaghetti Western, film noir, black exploitation, vintage Shaw Brothers Kung Fu films, Grindhouse, of course, like crime drama, whatever he's incorporating. But it is odd in that it, it, it becomes his own thing. And I think there's a lot to say about that because of his sort of visual prowess and also his writing his extreme, extreme talent at writing, especially writing interaction between characters, dialogue and stuff. He's just one of the best in the business at that. So even though it's like this pastiche of everything he loves, it still becomes his own thing. And I love Kill Bill. I mean, there's so much to say about it. This has been on the list since day one. It'll be nice to talk about Tarantino again. We've already done Django. We've done uh, Inglorious Bastards. So now to have another conversation, of course, Pulp Fiction will eventually get to but Kill Bill Volume 1, dude, I remember like I was trying to channel the excitement and the enthusiasm circa 2003 because this film was all over our radar with trailers. And then I was go I went back on YouTube and was like, let me see if I could see the the trailer and sort of get a, a, a some sort of remembrance of like how it felt when this was coming out and the excitement. And it, it's actually the teaser trailer. The other theatrical trailers that first teaser that came out with the theme song and with the edited scenes, there's a lot of scenes that actually were cut out of both films. And at this time, it was probably in the editing process too. Like there were there's stuff that turned out to be in volume two that are in the trailer for volume one. So it's really interesting. And I just remembered, you know, it just ignited that excitement again, seeing it on the big screen. I remember 2003 being there in the theater with Helene, seeing it and just it being like a real joyful experience, you know, which we'll get into. And I think a lot of that is like, it felt to me like Pulp Fiction blended with like a martial arts film, like a Kung Fu film. And at that time, we were already digging like the Stephen Chow films, like Kung Fu Hustle, but especially like all the Jet Li stuff, all the Hong Kong Wire Kung Fu stuff that was coming out, Crouching Tiger, House of Flying Daggers. Like that was the period where all this stuff was like, you know, hero. We were digging all that stuff. So it was like the perfect timing in fact, it was kind of weird like that Jet Li was kind of missing from this project, I feel like. And we'll get into Sonny Chiba and Gordon Liu and everything. But yeah, man, I mean, that's a, that's a fair place to start. And you know what the other thing that struck me initially in watching this again? You know, I just really kind of like ritualized at this time. You know, I waited for the kids to go to bed, grabbed a couple of cold beers, sat down with a movie I know I was going to enjoy again. And it's so layered. Like you get some, something out of it every time. But I remembered, of course, like it's a Tarantino joint. So it's like a visual feast. But what was a surprise and what I was reminded of was the music, like the way music is integrated into the film and the way it punctuates moments and set pieces and stuff. It's so like, think about Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction and Jackie Brown too. Like the, the initial three films before this, they did the same thing. And I think this just took it to a whole nother level. It's just the, the music is, is a character in this film. And I was so Absolutely. like delighted to be reminded of that. So cool. It is a great reminder and a great, well said. It's interesting because when I, this came out, I was going into college, <clears throat> I think. And so I was kind of getting out of that phase where I was seeing a lot of movies. That was like a high school thing for me. And I also wasn't a Tarantino person. Like I, that was meaningless to me in 2003, 2004, yeah, yeah. 2005. I was like, I don't know, Tarantino. I, I know that name, but I don't give a, I don't give a damn about <laughs> Jackie Brown or Pulp Fiction. It wasn't until I was older that I really 
could appreciate how amazing he is. And I think that Kill Bill, I have to go back and watch some movies I haven't seen in a while. I haven't seen Pulp Fiction in a while. I haven't seen Jackie Brown in a while, but Kill Bill out of the ones I've seen, the only one I didn't see, I was just looking actually, the only Tarantino film I haven't seen is the new one, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, sure. And I I didn't see. You're going to like that movie. And I didn't see that random like death proof movie or whatever he did. Oh, anything okay. else I've seen. I feel okay. like Kill Bill is maybe his weakest film that I've Interesting. seen. Interesting. Interesting. But I think that it's because it focuses more on the things that are irrelevant to me and even in Tarantino, like cool fight scenes and stuff. Like that's cool, but uh, I use this as an example. Uh Indiana Jones has a lot of really cool fight scenes, but the most memorable Indiana Jones fight scene is when he takes the gun out and kills the dude. Oh, it's right. Wow, ge- ingenious. Which is much better than watching a 10 minute scene of them fighting. And it's funny and you can't do that over and over again, but it's funny and it's humorous and it's a way to kind of deal with that. Like I said, the way the movie began, I was like, uh, it's cool. It's fun to watch, but I remember why I think as when I was younger, this wasn't something that got me into, into Tarantino. It took a while. Like Tarantino, I think my entry into really caring about Tarantino happened with Django Unchained. Right. Like, I you think that was that. the movie. Yeah, I love I adore really that movie. That. And I was like, holy moly. And then when you go back, I had seen Inglorious Bastards already at that time and stuff. But you go back and you watch some of this stuff. And you're like, Damn, this guy is amazing. So, so I think I just wasn't I wasn't sophisticated enough to know that yet. And so going into Kill Bill, I just say that as a quantifier because I or a qualifier rather. I'm sorry, is that it's a wonderful movie, but I think it's probably one of my least favorite um, of his of his pieces. And it's surprising because it is. So video game-ish or Katana. I mean, why I want to talk about why we just love Katanas as a people. But I'm curious what you think the movie's about, especially with not because I don't really know what happens in the second movie. I've definitely never seen it. Oh, and, really? Oh, that's yeah. gonna be a fun and talk. And we can and we can get into that. I don't care if we spoil it, but I not knowing, I'm curious what you think this movie is about because the way I kind of summed it up in my own notes was it seems like it's just a movie very straightforward about a mom's rage and that's a common theme i don't know why we're so comfortable as creators going back to this common theme of this mama bear like rage where you get in between a child and its mother and how much fear and emotion comes out of that so that's it's a cool way to start and it's interesting because through that story i think and what i appreciate about this movie a lot and tarantino does is that it doesn't shy away from taboos at all and what i mean by that and and it, and it's to the point of the story even though it's difficult to watch the violence is over the top i think even compared to any of his movies and that's totally fine but i think it goes even further than that i think basically killing a woman in front of her child is interesting i think like there are video games for instance where you can't even aim and shoot at child models like in fallout for instance or yeah something. Like you sure. can't you literally can't light the kids up when you encounter it them, won't let you, you want to it. It won't let you do it Okay, And because there's like some sort of just cultural sensitivity around that. And I thought specifically the the buck scene, like the rape scene, basically, where she's like a sex doll. I was like, this is an extreme case of sexual abuse that really um, puts her character into perspective, her pain into perspective, but it's also a tough thing to write and showed me how talented he was in, in making it so that it didn't feel as gratuitous as it was because it was important to get that story out to tell the full nature of this character whose name i still don't know so i can't ruin that for you that's right right. you haven't seen two okay which is also interesting so yeah what where do we begin on on this on this film i'm curious what you think about it and let's dive into it more stylistically the movie has a, a wonderful as tarantino films do a way to frame shots and I love the the symmetry, for instance, of the shot when they're fighting in the house in the beginning and the bus pulls up the bay window in the front. Like there's a lot of really great shots. And of course, all the stuff at the restaurant at the end is also well shot. And I'll tell you something that I told Micah and surprised her of is I, I've eaten at that restaurant in Tokyo. Um, oh, and really? I, and I, yeah. And I totally forgot. I had totally forgotten about that. Oh, so I can talk shit. about that a little later as well. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the style. What what do you make of the the style of the film? And I think it's inherent embrace of camp. And I think also it's embrace of 
I usually like to get into the weeds with things that are don't make sense in films. For instance, when she's when she kills Buck and then is in his car for 12 hours, like that doesn't make any sense. Right. But this is not one of those because like it's like they're going to know that. But this is the kind of film where it's like, ah, it doesn't matter. It, right. it, everything feels like really well coordinated. I think part of that is because he's so deliberate with his films. He doesn't get distracted. He doesn't do a, lot, a ton of products. He doesn't seem to really chase the money. He's really into one thing at a time. And I think it allows him to solve things in really special ways. And I think that comes out in the, the film's aesthetic style and the, the way the film shot, the Absolutely. dialogue and all of the rest. So talk to me a little bit about all of that. Yeah, it's very, he's very authentic filmmaker. You know, that's one thing you may love Quentin Tarantino's work. You may dislike his stuff, but it's coming from a very authentic place, right? It's coming from a place of skill. It's coming from a place of the films he admired. He's a film buff. He's a rabid film, like aficionado. He knows film through and through. He knows. And so he brings that knowledge, not only that skill set, but that knowledge in with him. And like you said, he's true to it. You know, he's not, you feel like he's not beholden to the dollar. Like the money's going to come, obviously, when you have this talent, this kind of unique style of vision, this flavor, very, which is very unto Quentin Tarantino as an individual. But Camp, definitely, I agree with you there. And the fact that he does such genre bending and genre blending. Like, I love what you said about the opening fight scene with the Vernita Green character. Like, it's basically taking like the most brutal fight scene from like an action flick and then merging that with like a rom-com suburban setting. You know, you only see someone like Quentin Tarantino pull that off. You know what I mean? Which is like taking a little bit of this, taking a little bit of that and then blending it together. I also feel like we'll talk about the animated segment, which I love produced by production IG in Tokyo, but, um, I feel like the entire film is a live action anime too, which I already met, remember getting the sense of that from the teaser trailer before the movie even came out. I was like, this is going to be a proper send up to like, you know, anime, martial arts films, old Shaw Brothers, Kung Fu, action, spaghetti Western. He's going to take all of that. You know what I mean? And I love the way he'll take like spaghetti Western vantage points perspectives from the camera and merge that with a kung fu film stuff you've never seen before you know that he's kind of creating for the first time he's taking those influences and he's mixing them up in this stew in a way that you've never really witnessed you know and if you have maybe in a short film here and there or something small but he's taking all these different things and he's making it something brand new and from 2000 especially from a perspective almost 20 years now to almost 20 years old pretty special you know, and pretty fun. I think what also kind of speaks to his style is working non sequentially. In other words, telling the story out of order. I, it's very clever because it actually works for stylizing things. You know what I mean? It's much easier to stylize when you're doing a clip here, a clip there. You're moving backwards. Now you're moving forwards. Now you're skipping ahead in time. Now you're going back a couple of steps. It's very, it's very easy to stylize and make each thing feel like its own little short film. And then you blend it all together. If you're going out of order, that works. If you're moving sequentially, that's going to be very hard to pull off because like, what am I watching here? You know, very, very clever. Very like, really speaks to me as like, he, he's interesting because he's so obviously self-indulgent, but because the, the stuff is coming from a place of like real authenticity, it just works. You know what I mean? You believe it. You know what I mean? It's not a lie. It's like, it's really how he feels. It's really what he enjoys. And he's imparting that onto the audience. It's almost like sharing his joy. It's also weird for me too, Kyle. Like, I wonder how you feel about this. You're a little less squeamish generally in movies, but the violence could be very brutal. And I don't necessarily go in for that with movies. I, I kind of endure it because I love all the other Tarantino hallmarks. You know, I like put up with it. What I love, and I remember you talking to you about this not too long ago with one of our John Wick conversations, is I like the tone of a John Wick where obviously there's a lot of killing going on. The action is brutal, but it's not necessarily overly graphic or gory. The tone is much more fun and upbeat. Even though you have these horrific things going on and all this danger and all this violence. It's it. The presentation is very fun and very uh, lighthearted, almost and cartoony. Tarantino's not afraid. He's not a sentimental filmmaker. 
not only will he explore taboos, which you mentioned already, which is a very important thing to say, but he'll go down into the depths of like violence. Um, he'll and he'll show it. You know what I mean? He's not afraid to show it. That's a really brutal thing with the bride character, in that not only has she been so terribly wronged by her tribe, right? She's this female assassin who was basically betrayed by her people. You have that whole thing going on, was robbed of her unborn daughter as well. On top of that, you're going to tell me that she was basically sex trafficked and then show one of those interactions, one of those exchanges on screen? Like, that's horrible. Ultimately, I like it because it plays into your sympathy and you're really rooting for her. You know what I mean? It's like really a good versus evil story. It requires an art. It requires an artist to absolutely be able to, to, to meld all those elements together. Yeah, to love, create create a character like he did with Uma Thurman and love a character and really nurture this thing over years and then put her in that situation. It takes a, not only a creativity, but a discipline to be able to do that, that. I don't know that I have that. You know what I mean? Where it's like that character, I know what it is to create characters. Like that character becomes a real thing. And you care for it almost like a real living, breathing person. And like to put her in that situation and stuff, it's like, Again, it's very Tarantino. It's part of the Tarantino flavor, like to be able to, like in Glorious Bastards, right? Like we all hate Nazis, but they put Nazis in some pretty precarious, horrifying situations. He's not afraid to go there. Say that, right? He's not afraid to really go there. And I really tip my cap for that. Even though it's not my style personally, I admire him for it, you know, if that makes sense. Definitely. Um, it's interesting because. I feel like anything taken too far that he did would have ruined the movie, right? It's just, it's an interesting tightrope to watch a filmmaker walk as you deal with all these things. And I was thinking specifically about that, the sex trafficking, like rape scene or rape part of the movie, because that's often a contentious part of filmmaking games, books or whatever. That's often brought up as like, oh, there's a really bad representation of rape and so on and so forth. And you hear about that so on and, 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 uh, once in a while in entertainment. And I've never heard that about Kill Bill. Like when I was going in, having really not remembered the movie very well, I was like, oh, I don't remember this at all. In fact, when the pussy wagon thing in the beginning happened, <laughs> when she like drives off, and then I was like, I don't even remember like, how she gets that. And so it was, it was fun watching it from that perspective as well. But I did, uh, in going into the taboo, I, what I really love in the beginning in the first scene is she says, um, Uma, the bride, says to the daughter, quote, you can take my word for it. Your mother had it coming. If you still feel raw about it, I'll be waiting, you know, which is which is awesome. Like just an amazing code of ethic that these people have a way of talking to each other. It's very comic book. It's very camp. And I dig that a lot. I'm curious what you make of some of these other characters, though. We, talk to me a little bit about Vivica A. Fox's Vernita Green, code, code name Copperhead. Dude. Um Really interesting scene in the beginning, the way the whole film starts. So let's start with her and talk talk a little bit about that character and that scene and what you take away from it. Yeah, it all but starts with this battle. We have this assassin on Pasadena. her. Pasadena. Pasadena, right? Very well represented. Yeah, it looks perfect. Um, yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm a, like obsessed with that part of California. I think I've mentioned that to you before. Like if I moved to Southern California, like that's the area I'd want to be in. because I And I think because it's very... LA centric. It looks very specific, but it also has that East Coast feel to it a little bit. Like just that they're neighborhoods. I love the flavor of it though, that like every house could look different. It's just not like that on the East Coast. Like you might live in a neighborhood with like eight different model houses and they base generally look the same. And then also like some places like where we grew up in South Bellport, like beholden to certain codes. Like you could paint your shutters green, you could paint your shutters black. Like there's a very northeastern especially on the water feel to this part of the country. And I love the color, like the fact that you could be colorful and playful out there. Like you can make your house, everybody's house could look different. And they could still look nice. Like, Hey, like that's a novel concept. So I love that area. And I love starting the film all, but starting the film with this scene, like these two grown women, one suburban housewife having this basically knife fight in a living room that goes over into the kitchen. Kid gets off the bus like exploring the violence, but also the comical value in that. Very Tarantino. I'll tell you what struck me about this scene and watching it again, though, that I'm sure it dawned on me in the past as well. Vivica Fox, dude, she, 
I don't know if she was bringing like an actual fighting knowledge or more. I'm sure she trained for the film. Martial arts training or whatever. Maybe she even grew up with that. I have no idea. But I 100% buy it. Like her physicality. You know, it's nice. We start to get the flavor of Uma Thurman's character, the bride and what she's capable of and who she's up against. And this is the first one that we see. Dude, like that knife fight looks real. Like Vivica Fox, every every movement is so on point, sharp and elegant. Like there's no way I'm fighting Vivica Fox like or Vanita Green in that scene. Like she looked like she would she I it's it's completely authentic. Like I, I just. It feels like a real knife fight. You know what I mean? They're going through the plate glass tables and knocking down the shelves and all that. But just like the way she's moving with that knife and how she has her her free hand like as an assist. Like, I don't know anything about fighting or martial arts, but that is a very, very um, memorable representation of like, it looks real. It really looks real to me. And I don't know, that might be the biggest look you get I forget volume two. We're going to watch it soon and talk about it soon. But I think that might be the biggest taste you get of Vernita, the Vernita Green character as far as what she's capable of. But it's a great entry point, man. It's a great place to start. And the fact of like, you know, trying to like apologize, like she knows she's in deep shit that over that whole scene. And but also like you see the treachery, like she has the gun in the box of Kaboom, you know, another like cultural touchstone for Tarantino, like leave it to him like not only incorporating like martial arts films and gordon Liu, but like kaboom serial like all the pop culture touchstones like the music like it's all like it's all stuff that he loves it's all it's nostalgia you know like it, it, that could have been a box of raisin bran but he made it a box of kaboom it's it's awesome like that's just a tarantino calling card you know that's a, and it starts the movie and you make you realize like wow we're in for like we're in for a crazy wild ride. And you know what the other thing about going non-sequentially, Kyle? I think you mentioned this. Like going out of order and kind of revealing bits of the story and 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 revealing different things at different times is a fun way to piece together what's happening, you know, and, and bring up different things. Like you're saying the pussy wag and how that'll play into volume two later on. And like, you know, a very clever way to keep you dialed in and keep you interested, I think. Which I wonder. If that's a part of it for him, or if he would just if, if if it's more like the stylization, like he wants to be able to make it more like an anime, so it's just that you could take more liberties that way. I wonder about T- Tarantino with that. I, I feel e- either event, you know, in any event, I feel like that fearlessness really comes through. Like he'll try, he'll do anything. I'm curious what you. So we we have this this like I said, sudden intro very scream like intro that sets the stage, but then they, they slow things down. And, and by the way, I did want to speak to what you were saying about non sequential storytelling. I think non sequential storytelling is risky and I think it can be really annoying actually. But I think that if you know how to do it, it works really well. I think an example of something that does it really well was the show lost. Sure. And I think something that did it really poorly was a game like beyond two souls from quantic dream in which when they re-released it on PS4, they gave you the option to put it in order sequentially because it was so, haphazardly oh, wow. put together otherwise so it's easy to imagine a situation where um could be confusing right exactly if you if you're on that pudding. right you're on that razor's edge but they give us a little more context after this because you see this this marriage scene this wedding scene now we have at the end of this film i don't know what has really happened here we know that there's some sort of combat and some sort of fight but we i don't know who the, the man was we know she was pregnant and lost the baby all of this what do you make of this whole aside? Some of the characters that are introduced here, I'm really quite fond of these police characters. I love, <laughs> and this is another one of these things that Tarantino does that I just really enjoy. Just the, the shots. I look at it. I, I look at this. And I'm like, there's just no way I could do something like this, right? There's no way that I would know that this was cool enough to do in a nice enough shot. And you know, the shot I'm talking about here is the shot of the cops aviator glasses on his dashboard. Oh, like, this is man. awesome. Like, this is just such a great, touch and another piece of panache like that gives the movie a little bit of color but this is kind of the mystery that everything surrounds with this 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 what happens at this church we don't i don't again we don't really quite know yeah. by the end so what do you make of what we garner from these scenes and from these characters and to your point this is where the quote comes in that revenge is never a straight line 
which is a great oh, line, man. which is a great line as well. So that. talk to me a little bit about these cops, this, this stuff in El Paso and what we know about it, what we can garner from it so far. Yeah, the massacre in El Paso, right? You know that something went down at this church where the bride is betrayed. I got to be careful because I don't want to ruin part two for you. It's at, we, we don't know why at this point. We know the deadly viper assassination squad led by Bill comes into this church and massacres everybody. Nine people were killed, including the bride, including her husband. They say the organist, the preacher, everybody's dead. And except the bride, obviously. And yeah, you get the, these cop characters. They're in there. They're trying to figure things out. You got this sleepy, this, you know, this mass murder in this sleepy town. So they're wondering what the hell's going on. And you get this kind of like cool, calm and collected cop played by Michael Parks, one of the great character actors. By the way, you'll see Michael Parks pop up in volume two in another role. I guarantee you don't recognize who, him in that movie. It's a, one of the memorable, one of the great memorable performances of the 2000s. But he's great as the cop character and also like, you know, paints this really, really continues to paint this really, really harsh world for the bride where it's like, even the guy investigating this thing is like a little bit of a pervert. He's a little bit unsavory. You know, it's like the kind of fleshing out this world of like, what the fuck is, is this woman up against here? Right. You know, you know, so great. And you know, like those little character, uh, marquees that Tarantino paints without saying a word, like the, like the range of aviator glasses on the dashboard of the car. Like you don't even have to say anything. You just show that it's just great writing. It's great storytelling. And that's what I'm talking about. Like you have a movie, it's a, it's like a, a road movie or a revenge movie. It seems on its surface to be pretty like, you know, rooted in action and spectacle. And it's this visual tour de force, but there's a lot of depth in there, man. And there's a lot of great storytelling. I mean, it's like, we talk about the great writers like Cormac McCarthy, like it's no different. Like Tarantino pulls that off. It's not just his dialogue. It's not just his outlandish stories. It's how he paints the picture, you know? And that's what makes this movie so special. Even if you don't go in for Tarantino, you feel like he's a little bit of a windbag. He's like, you know, he can, he can hit or miss in interviews. Sometimes he seems a little bit full of himself and stuff, but the art, man, you can't make any arguments against the art. It's just, you know, it's through and through. It's just some of the best shit. Yeah, I would be. I've seen some contentious interviews with him, too, but it's like, don't waste this man's time. Right. It's another guy. I was like, I don't have anything. I, it's another guy. I don't wouldn't necessarily want to meet because it's like, I don't even know what to say to you. Just do whatever it is you do. I feel and, like that, too, with him. And a magician doesn't. It's that whole thing, right? A magician doesn't want to talk about how he did the trick. He just wants to do the next trick. You know, the part of the magic is not is doing it, not talking about it, even though I feel like he, I feel like he's more enthusiastic about talking about his influences rather than his own work, which speaks to me of Tarantino. Look at his movies. You know, it's all in there. Everything he's driven by is right in, is right in the thing he creates. Special. I want to focus a little bit on the Deadly Viper assassination squad itself. Just the way it's presented, we see, we don't really meet everyone yet, which is cool. But we see some of them, and I want to focus in specifically on this L driver, Daryl Hannah character, which is mm. so campy and interesting. So campy. And her name is California Mountain Snake. And we, I guess, learn more about her clearly in the next film. But we do, yeah. I like how they have this code of conduct in which they're trying to kind of finish off this. We, we learn that they know she lived, we, they try to finish her off and then pull back, I guess, Bill or whoever pulls pulls back but what did you make of this performance i just think this is such a a silly very anime style character there's two characters in this movie above all else that i think are just incredibly incredibly anime and it's her and it's the character gogo -Go. so oh, which we'll talk about later so talk to me a little bit about daryl hannah and and what we know a little bit about yeah her, one her of the character. campiest characters in this for sure and we will see her more in part two very interesting character. And you know what's what really what's great about this first chapter, this first volume, is that it paints the picture of you got Bill, right? You know he's the target, it's right in the title. He's he's the main adversary, he's the top baddie. And so you could already, by the end of the film, you know, here's this guy. He's this leader of this group of assassins who are, you know, trained in martial arts and some of the deadliest people in the world, apparently. And he's got this group of proteges that are all women that are also all his lovers, 
right? So you're like, who the fuck is this guy? Already, it already like paints those questions of like, who is this dude? And you don't even see his face. I don't think in this chapter you see him when he's talking to L, the Daryl Hannah character. He's kind of like playing with his sword, and you see his hand, and, and then you see him talking to Sophie at the end. But you don't see him yet. You don't get a big taste of him visually. So you have to kind of intimate what he's about and you know he has this group of assassins that work for him that he also beds apparently right he's got all these girls he's got all these lovers they're all beautiful and he it's and his brother so it's it's bill his brother bud who we don't see will will get to meet really much more so much more so in volume two and then this group of women who work for him and that also you know uh act as like his i don't know what do you want to call it like Oh, Escort. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, it's got, yeah, lovers. I guess yeah. they're kind of like, especially like the bride character, you'll get to know like she's more of um a like um what do you call it? Like an inspiration for him. She's more of a, a muse. A muse. Like they're a group of muses that he, you know, he uses in his own way. So you you know, here you have this very manipulative, very charismatic dude at the top, and all of his underlings. And you know, how each one of them is a little different. You have El Driver. You have one that basically heads up the Japanese mafia. You have Uma Thurman. You have one that became like trying to blend in as a housewife. So it's really interesting how, you know, it's like how he has these individuals, but they're all like, they're all his protégés. You know, he's the mentor of this group of women, basically. Let's talk about next, in, in my notes anyway, I want to get to the restaurant scene towards the end, although there are other things that we have to accomplish at some point because there's just a lot to speak about in this in this short film, although I think it'll become more complicated once we have the second part. But Oren Ishii, Lucy Liu's character, this Chinese-American-Japanese Yakuza boss. Now, my story about this restaurant is... Um, it's funny because I did go here in when I, one of the times I went to Japan. That's so cool. And I didn't know that it was anything special. Shuhei Yoshida from Sony invited me to meet him for dinner somewhere. So I did. And I just took a, like a taxi there and they pointed me in the right direction. And I walked in and apparently he's like, oh, this is like the, you know, where Kill Bill, that fight scene in Kill Bill was. I didn't know I was that like, was a real, is it really called the House of Blue Leaves? Do you remember? I don't know what it was. I have no, I couldn't speak to that. So Maybe. cool. But yeah, it's like a real space. And um, yeah, I ate there with him one night. So that was that's kind of an interesting touchstone I have to that scene. But that's so cool. I'm jealous. But uh, I wanted to say, to, I don't often like to interconnect our shows with each other necessarily, unless obviously it's like a series or, but we just did one on Metal Gear Solid 3. And one of my major qualms with that film or that movie, I'm sorry, that game was the flippant use of language that you're speaking Russian technically throughout much of the game, but it doesn't ever differentiate who's speaking what and when, who understands what and when. And it's hard for me to impress upon some people apparently who are really, especially fanboyish about that game. Be like, don't you understand how much it could have benefited the story to know who's speaking what, when and how and why and who can understand things. And you know what movie really represents the exact potential of that sort of thing and why it's mastery is this movie. Yeah. And it was funny. I couldn't escape from that as people are going between their various languages, specifically Japanese and English, but others as well. It adds so much texture and height as people you don't understand each other. They, they don't know who's speaking when it, it adds a whole lot of confusion. And I love how that all comes to bear towards the end of the movie. And it just I needed to say, like, see Metal Gear Solid 3 fans like this is how you use language so that you can mystify the audience confuse those around the protagonist or give inspiration to the antagonist all the rest it's a, it's a really wonderful thing and and the, the barriers that are created with language here forcing the audience to read a ton is great and i don't think again it's a thing that a lot of filmmakers would get away with doing there are quite a few of those things in this film but yeah i am curious what you make of that of that character lucy Lu's character um that scene and all the rest i mean there's so much to say about it yeah, she's a, she's really like a main emphasis character, you know, one of the five targets, five or six targets for for the bride character, top of her list by the way. And such an interesting character because she's of half Chinese and half Japanese heritage of American descent, like she's from she's from America, from the West. And 
basically like this Yakuza top Yakuza crime boss now. Also, of course, heavily associated with Bill and his assassins. But she has this place at the top of the the, the Japanese crime syndicates and such an interesting character because I lo- and I love how each one of the baddies, like each one of the antagonists, and we'll see this even carried out further in volume two, Kyle, like they each have their own world. You know, Sophie and Oren and Gogo are in this in this inner, very insulated, innermost Japanese Tokyo crime circle world, but they're all like kind of embedded in their own place now. They've kind of like spread to the like Voltron, right? They're kind of like spread to the the five corners of the world and then they're going to reunite at some point or the bride's going to make sure they reunite. But, and I love the fact, there's a really interesting thing going on with the Oren Ishii character too because we find out the most about her in this movie. We find out her origins, that her dad was a military man and somehow her family ran afoul of the Yakuza and murdered her parents. And her whole life was revenge, getting revenge. Like she disguised herself as like a young, young call girl and an escort and murdered the people that wronged her family, that murdered her family. And then you could see like, I don't know if we ever get this story, but you could see Bill kind of swooping in and taking him under her wing of like, oh, this, this woman's already like a badass. Like this is, she, this is a perfect proxy for me. And then we see like by the time she's in the late teens, early 20s, she's a one of the foremost assassins in the world. And we get that whole production IG animated segment origin segment of her, which is so cool. So beautifully. Yeah. Done. Take so a moment gorgeous. to t- take some time to talk about that. Um, it's uh, so great, man. It's a, yeah. not only does it paint the picture of a great character and one of the bride's targets, but also there's a lot of parallels between the Oren Ishii and the bride character. And the fact of like, there should be some sort of sympathy there because they both, they're both driven by the same thing. They're both driven by revenge. So even though one's, it, it's interesting that Oren ran afoul of the bride and did her wrong that way because she knows how it feels to be betrayed. She knows what it, what it feels like to be fueled by revenge. Mm. So those two characters have a lot in common, which I think is really cool. And maybe that even plays up the fact that they are such deadly enemies. Um, but that animated segment, I remember that not even being, I don't think that was even in any of the trailers to my best recollection Certainly not in the teaser trailer that I loved before the movie opened in the theaters. So that was a really big treat for me going in and seeing that segment. Like all of a sudden it cuts away to this animated segment. It's pretty lengthy. And Production IG is top in the credits. Like it's one of the first things like animation by Production IG, Tokyo, Japan. Like it's really early in the credits. So I love seeing that that nod. And Production IG was, you know, to give you guys a little origin, like there's a lot of studios now, like look at Disney Visions, like a lot of top anime studios that are known for their quality and their style and the projects they created. But Production IG was one of the first ones coming out of the late 80s into the 90s and into the early aughts that was that was really known for its craft and the artfulness and the quality of their their work. So it was really a treat, like harkening back to 2003 to see them involved in a Quentin Tarantino project. Makes sense. They were already probably a household name with a lot of creators, especially someone as nerdy and a Japanophile like Quentin Tarantino is, you know. And I love the segment because it's beautifully animated, all hand animated, very stylized, really gorgeous. It has that rough, almost xerography look to the moving line. Like it has like a really kinetic energy to the art direction. And it's brutal. You know, it's a brutal piece of animation. It's violent, it's gory, it's kind of unapologetic. And it has, it sets the tone for, it fits in with the rest of the movie, but it's extra jarring to see that in animated form. It's just the way it is. You know what I mean? Like, I think maybe it's a Westerners, even a Westerner like me, like our look at an animation. It's like you, you don't, you, you're reminded that it's not just kid stuff. You know what I mean? It's like very, very adult oriented. And to see that sort of tone carried over into the animation and then go back into the live action, it's just beautifully done. And it's a bold choice for a director. That's why you don't see that a lot. You know, only a guy like Tarantino could really pull that off because he knew, knew exactly what that segment needed to be. And it was very clever to make it one of the top bad guys, one of the most important bad guys to make it their origin story. You know, it just really works for that. And um, 
I was disappointed not to see that. Not no spoilers, but for volume two, they don't carry over the animated treatment. It's probably very expensive. And, and I would love it's something that I would love to see more in film. You know what I mean? Like just to incorporate and just remind people like this is a legit form of storytelling. It's just a it's not a genre. It's just another way of telling a story. It's another filmmaking technique. And it it was so cool, like even coming into this loving Tarantino already, it's like it, it made me love him even more that he would embrace animation as a storytelling medium in a feature film. It wasn't like a side project or something that he wrote. It was like, you know, his fourth feature. It's a big deal. Like he still says, maintains, and we'll talk about this at the end of the show, like that he's only going to do 10 features and number nine was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So he's only got one left. Yeah, it's I said, I he hope that's to his guns. Yeah, I hope that that's not true, but he's got to do what he's got to do. I, I think with the animation, it was a, it was really bold. I agree with you. It's just a bold decision to do that. It heightens the the medium, although it's not a medium, as I've said many times that I necessarily jive with completely. If I'm given a different option, there are always exceptions to the rule. The one thing I would have really thought would have been cool dig or like a really interesting decision. Yeah. Would have been if it would have been expensive and you find out with that, that Lucy Liu character, it's just too much of the movie, but it wouldn't have been neat if just one arc coming off of the bride was just all animated. And that was so like the entire thing, it just spliced back to it. It wasn't all just this one animated sequence, but rather when you learned about this character or visited this character or fought this character, it just was that whole thing was animated. That's and everything else idea. was really, you know, that would have been kind of a neat That's awesome. decision. So that Lu- Lucy Liu is just the voice or whatever, right? I mean, she's sure. wonderful in the film, but it would have, it would have been cool to just see something like that, like a more, a buy-in and then maybe wonder why is this being remembered like this? Why is it being told like this? Cause it's not being told like that for any specific reason other than I think to heighten the Japanese influence of the movie and, sure. and all of that. But like when you, when I was watching it, I was wondering how far the cartoon was going to go or the anime was going to go in the sense, are they trying to avoid how difficult it's going to do to be to do the, the overt violence that a katana is going to wield a bunch of all these different people. And then they're like, Oh no, 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 we're going to do that too. No, we're going to show you that. Yeah. yeah. So it, that was kind <laughs> of a nice surprise too. Cause you could imagine people criticizing something like that for that reason, where it's kind of like a cop out. Oh, we can't, sure. but no, they didn't, they didn't do that, which I think makes it all the stronger. Oh, abs- that's a great point, man. Absolutely. But Absolutely. I'm curious what you make about this, this end sequence that we get into this lengthy kind of fight scene, everything at the restaurant, the tension being built is awesome. I love when she throws the dart out of the, the door oh, and so go out she to see her there. Yeah. It's super, it's just a super cool scene. The band is playing. The band is really playing. You can tell that they're definitely playing on that. Like, I, I get really fixated on live bands in shows and movies because they're usually really bad as far as the way that they're mimicking the movies yeah, and stuff. Point. It annoys the shit out of me. If you if you don't know any better, then you're never going to know. But like watching a guy play drums like this, you know, like I <laughs> like or like being totally off beat or whatever. But they're they're definitely playing what they're playing. Yeah, As a musician, you can you can't go for that. No, and I would imagine that that's not something that Tarantino would ever abide by, right? He's not going to yeah, put a person behind so. a bar that doesn't know how to wield a bottle. He's not going to put a person behind a drum kit that doesn't know how to play it. And so I, I think that that was a really cool scene as well. But even everything leading up to that bar, the motorcycles and the katanas, what is it that we love so much about Kawasaki Ninja style Japanese motorcycles and katanas? I don't understand why they're so cool. And I, I love that he leans into that at a time like you say totally. that it's not necessarily a mainstream thing quite yet we're we're getting there behind the scenes i mean w- w- talk to me a little bit more about, more about the scene and also the violence because you were talking I, i'm curious to pick your brain about this you were talking about earlier about the violence and and how it maybe even is a little much it's a much for you like you're, you even get a little squeamish at it i don't mike is the same way she doesn't like violence it doesn't bother me really ever i don't like real violence like if i watch I've seen horrible things. We've all seen, maybe not all of us, but like when you see like an ISIS beheading video oh, or sure, something like that, real thing. that's yeah, real. Yeah. That's way different than seeing a horror movie. I don't care. Like, I don't care. I, you can show me all the violence you want. It does not bother me. But I think he does something and I don't know if it's intentional and I don't even know if it's really true, but it's something that I feel is true. I feel like the blood isn't quite right. And it doesn't, it's not the right, it's not quite the right red. It's too bright. And it reminds me a lot of Danganronpa, which does the video game series, which does it yeah. much more extreme where the blood in those games is actually pink 
And it, those oh, games okay. are really violent, but it kind of tones it down and actually adds to the foreboding cartoonishness of the game and how crazy sure. the games are. So that's a stylistic choice there as well. There's just something about the violence being so overt and over the top that I'm like, this isn't scary or squeamish to me because this is not the way it would go. First of all, it, it, everything about this is impossible, right? But it doesn't matter. It's fun. So right. I'm not complaining about it. I'm simply saying that if it was Saving Private Ryan level gore that was much more realistic, like bodies washing up on the shore, that to me is much darker than anything in this film, no matter the gallons and gallons and barrels of blood right. that they spill. Right. So talk to me a little bit about this fight scene and everything that leads up to it. Gogo as a character, if you want to bring her in. And it's just, it's funny because it's a little anticlimactic. There's just, it's just bodies and bodies and bodies and bodies. Like none of them really put up a fight. And it's, it's, it's a strange scene. I think it could actually be examined for, from a lot of different angles. Yeah. I mean, we're leading up to this. This is the set piece battle. This is where this volume, volume one is leading. This is the place where we end up. It's the big set piece, long battle, long fight. Um, the bride finally catches up with her target. I love what you said, Kyle, about just, if you're going to make a live action anime, like, make a live action anime. And if you're going to be a Japanophile, like go all in, like show Tokyo, show the highways, show the bright lights, show the Suzuki and Kawasaki motorcycles, the katanas, you know, really play up the anime angle. I mean, Sophie Fatale drives a 300 ZX, a Nissan 300 ZX, which is like a really, a real like ricer, like sought after Japanese car from like the early nineties, like a notorious twin turbo, super fast, like, like a Toyota super, like an iconic car. Like there was no mistake that Tarantino made her drive one of those. Everything is like a nod to Japan. You know what I mean? It's, it's super cool. And like, that's the level of depth. Like if you know this stuff, then you know, like, all right, this is super sick. And of course, all the iconic, the iconographic stuff that he introduces in the yellow jumpsuit, like the stuff that this movie is now known for. He puts a little bit of himself in there too. And the, the violence is another thing. It is very graphically violent. He does a lot of tricks. Like he goes to black and white when it gets to be really bloody, he goes to black and white, which he borrowed from a film. I forgot which film he borrowed that from. Are they but, doing that to avoid a rating? I was wondering that, like if it was a stylistic choice or not. I don't yeah. know because there's so much before and after. I know it was a nod to a specific samurai movie. I forget which one. But the whole thing is a nod to samurai movies. The mm. level of violence, the the action, some specific fighting moves, enemies and stuff like that. But, you know, if you're going to call up these influences, Lady Snowblood, Lone Wolf and Cub, anime, you know, vi the most violent sword sword play anime like it's all in there. It's part of the treatment. It's, you know, the gushing arteries and the constantly severed limbs. Like it's very, very exaggerated. So if you're going to make a live action cartoon, go for it. You know what I mean? I feel like that's what the House of Blue Leaves sequence really is, even with the band, you know, even with the five, six, seven, eights, that was a band that he said he found on a, on a trip in Tokyo. I don't know if he was on a research trip or if he was just on vacation. He said he was in a really trendy, like retro clothing store somewhere in Tokyo, and they were playing the five, six, seven, eights music. And he went to the person behind the register and was like, "Dude, I I need this. Like, you have to give me the CD." And they gave it to him. And he said, if the, if he left that store without them giving him the CD, he probably would have never even thought of it again or found them. Interesting. Or went with that. So that was a cool, like, little anecdote. Yeah. But setting that whole setting the whole tone, it feel it that whole bit. Like from the the point of the Oren's little Yakuza tribe going in and drinking in their own little private room and ordering pepperoni pizzas and making fun fun of the proprietors and the whole Charlie Brown. <laughs> Charlie Brown, it's so funny. Charlie Brown's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie Brown, so good, dude. <laughs> you know, but the whole thing, even leading up to the fight with the initial group and then the the, the crazy eighty eight coming in via you know their motorcycles later on and the real the big battle ensuing it all feels like something that you would see the scale of it and the level of exaggeration and just sort of the magnitude of of this whole thing culminating in this one set piece battle really feels like an anime you know what i mean there's nothing that he's doing whether it's the camera work or the level of blood or the effects or the level of extras he has in the shot like 
everything's on a huge scale. Like everything's really pushed to the umph, you know, the 10th, the, the, the tenth degree. Like it's just like, it's massive. And you could only really replicate that in animation. Like you couldn't even have made it any bigger. And that's what I love about it. You know what I mean? It really feels like everything it's sending up. And, um, you know, even, and, and it's, it's a logical place to end up too at the end of the story because everything's leading up to that. Everything's getting a little bigger, a little bigger. There's a, there's a head of steam growing, you know, everything's snowballing into that scene. And then also like, it can't be over. There's other scenes that I love in the movie that I want to talk about, but also like the head of steam that's built up with, again, tying in music, whether it's, you know, a lot of what Tarantino already does, which is finding music that already exists that's appropriate for the scene, but also RZA, you know, from the Wu-Tang Clan, Bobby Digi, scoring, you know, and providing the original music for the film. Again, him being a, a, a huge obviously a huge Kung Fu and martial arts film fan only on the order of Quentin Tarantino. So that whole thing too, the way they tie in music with the whole thing and just make it such a memorable, a memorable experience. I think that might be one of the reasons why the violence and the gore doesn't bother me as much as it could, because it is so stylized. You know what I mean? It is like so over the top and pushed and, you know, there's limbs flying and now she's cutting everybody's legs off and, um, you know, even the, even the, but it's brutal, but it is brutal. It's unapologetically brutal. I mean, even from the very beginning of calling out Oren and, and chopping off Sophie's arm, like it's pretty brutal shit. Like, you know, you see Sophie there like writhing around screaming on the floor. And then later on when you have all dead and half dead and mutilated, uh, subordinates on the floor, like they're all moaning and groaning. It's, you know, it's, he's not pulling any punches. He's not known for that, you know? Yeah, I, I actually enjoyed watching the scenes, like the few shots after like at all the combat where you just see the different actors do crawling. There's one guy like kind of maddeningly just running, walking around. And and it's funny because the 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 big vi- violent moves are the ones that don't really bother me. Like when Sophie gets her arm cut off, I'm like, eh, like, you that know, or, or when Go Go like guts the dude in the bar. Oh, yeah. During one of her backstories, I'm like, Jesus, this is kind of, especially because they, part. it almost makes it scarier because he doesn't linger too long, which I think is a smart move as well. But then there are scenes during the go-go fight, for instance, with the bride, I think when she slams the the nails into her foot and twists it or whatever, oh, that's man. like, brute. that's way more brutal than oh. anything else in the film to me. Yeah, it's realistic. And yeah, like that. I'm like, oh my God, like that's way worse than getting your head cut off. I like, ah, whatever, you know, I agree. Yeah. There's something that you're right. There is something about that. That rings true. Like, it's just like, there's a, there's a realistic level of violence or a relate, I guess a relatable level of violence, right. That just makes you cringe. Dave, let me back up a little bit. We've talked so much about the violence, which comes at the hand of this sword. What do you think about the scene of her getting the sword? I really, <sighs> enjoy this as well and i was thinking about this with um in the scene or whatever with hanzo where uma thurman has really amazing range oh she really does her acting in that scene is quite remarkable i i was really fixated on it she plays like a bubbly american naive girl or whatever woman and that's not who she is in the movie but i was looking at this character and i'm like holy shit this is you could just take this character and bring her somewhere else. And it, and this, it just goes to show the chops. I think, I think this, this scene specifically really heightens it. The way she acts calm, pretends she can't understand them as they're arguing with each other, pronounces things too closely to the original and all of that. What do you make about that whole scene in that, in that restaurant? You know, it's funny what you say about Uma Thurman. It reminds me like we all saw Pulp Fiction in the mid nineties, right? She, she was around, but that's the first time she was on everybody's radar, right? She played this iconic character, Mia Wallace, who was like the mall of like this big gangster guy, right? Or the wife actually of like this big gangster, notorious gangster type. And she's like the trophy wife. And she's so iconic in that, you know, her outfit, like the cool, slick Bob haircut, um, the attitude, the, the drug use, the banter, like her witty dialogue, everything about her, like it was like, oh, like you would think about Uma Thurman and Mia Wallace in the same breath. And you, 
it's almost like to the point of like, how do you top that as an actor? Like you're already going to be known for this for life. It's such an iconic role. And here she is topping it with the bride. I mean, I think the bride's an even better character, even more like notorious, like not only the aesthetic and the look with the yellow jumpsuit and the sword play, but like just the character is just, you know, it's a really grounded character for all of those cartoonish looks. It's like, you know, it really feels like a real life, someone you would know in real life, you know, oddly enough. And I think it's so interesting to me about the, her trip. We see the bride go off to Japan and she's looking to get a sword. And now we have the Sunny Chiba scene, which is broken into two halves, I would argue. Dude, first of all, this is honestly one of my favorite scenes in movies of the last 20 years. I watch this. I would go out of my way on YouTube to watch this scene every couple of months. There's something so, like, I think human, but also reverent and warm. First of all, shout out to Sonny Chiba. I just found out yesterday in researching he died mm. at 82 this year of COVID, of all things, I think back in the summertime. So we lost him. And he was an icon for of acting. He played, which I don't think I even realized this before researching, he played Hattori Hanzo in a Japanese TV series in the 60s and was one of those great martial artists that crossed over into Hong Kong, into Japanese cinema, into, into movies, you know, like a Jet Li, like a Gordon Liu, like a Bruce Lee, those type of guys. Like he was one of those dudes. And he, so he brings that heritage already in real life of like this known martial arts movie star icon. And then I think with the influx of nerd culture in the West, like he became a household name here, like he like, like he's been there for decades. So like a Gordon Liu to get him for Tarantino to get him instead of somebody playing a Sonny Chiba type is that's the kind of authenticity you want to see in your nerd movies, right? And I love Sonny Chiba's warmth. You know what I mean? Like, and he plays two parts in this. So you have the bride arriving in Okinawa. And she shows up and she seems like a gaijin, right? Like she's like this white girl straight from the States, walks in, acts like she doesn't know much Japanese, starts to develop this dialogue with this sushi restaurant proprietor. And there's like this warmth. There's like this really great chemistry and he's being really friendly. And he seems like to be, seems like a little kind of like hole in the wall type place. So he seems to be happy to have a customer. And they have this banter back and forth. And this playful thing where he's teaching her Japanese and there's a great warmth and like a lightheartedness and a great spirit, right? And you're wondering what this is leading up to. And then he's got his assistant or his partner at the restaurant. And I wanted to ask you this, Kyle, before I go any further. To me, it always struck of like, now you know, we know as an audience, this is Hattori Hanzo. This isn't like a sushi, like a hole in the wall sushi restaurant Uh chef this is like the the guy this is like the legendary ninja sword maker dude and she's seeking him out but he doesn't know he doesn't know that yet that that's what she's after and here he's got this guy working with him in the restaurant they got this real husband wife like old married couple thing going on where they're arguing and for some reason right from the beginning i remember feeling this way in the theater watching this you know 17 years ago I thought that they were kind of intimating that they were a homosexual couple. Like mm -hmm. it was kind of giving me that vibe. I've never heard it talked about. I've never heard anybody talk about this in a review or Tarantino or anybody. But I was always charmed by that. You know, I felt like it was a very inventive touch. Even so, even if not, it's like you, you got these two old friends and you got this r argumentative thing going on where the guy's like, you, you know, taking exception to being ordered around and everything like that. You have this whole like really lighthearted comical thing in the beginning. And then the scene, the tone of the scene changes. And at first it's the bride's tone who changes when she's like, I'm looking for a man. And like the whole scene seems to change. It doesn't, but the whole scene seems to change color. And you're like, Oh shit. If this is the guy, how is he going to react? And even in her acting, She's kind of expressing that, like, I'm saying this, but I'm not sure what's going to happen here. Like, this is a, this is a, this is a dangerous man. 
that's trying to hide and I'm calling him out. And I love the tonal change in the scene. And then the scene shifts to the attic, right? Dude, that, that music plays, I get very emotional. And I realize like, there's a couple of things going on in this scene. The Sonny Chiba character, the Hanzo character is kind of revealing himself. Like he's, he's agreeing to reveal himself. Like she found me and okay, the, the, the jig is up type of thing. Also, this is her fucking religion, dude. Like this is everything she stands for. There's such a reverence, like with almost touching the sword and then asking permission and all that kind of stuff. And then for me, and I'm not trying to be corny or sappy with this or anything. Like for me, I think it speaks to my soul because it's everything being honored that I grew up loving, right? Like starting with like, we've talked about this, like Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow and the Ninja Turtles, right? Mm -hmm. And then like Electra Assassin and Psylocke and just the idea of like martial arts and ninjutsu and Ninja Gaiden and Shinobi and Wrath of the Black Manta, like the video games you grew up with, like Kane all these and, crazy or I'm stuff. Not, I'm sorry, not Kane, Edge and Shadow in the Final Fantasy. Edge and Shadow, right, Final right. Fantasies, right? It's Final Fantasies. Um, Four and six. Four and six. So yeah, all of these things that we grew up being fascinated with, and now you're putting it on the screen and you're honoring it in this almost spiritual, um, religious way. And it's also, that's what's happening with the character. And I think that's why it makes me very emotional. Like I get teary eyed with this. I think the song playing, you know, helps drive up those emotions. And just this whole thing of like, this is their, this is their religion. This is their life. This is something, this is the, the thing that they dedicated their life to. And her almost like, I want to say orgasmic because it cheapens it. Like her almost religious response to feeling that sword, like you feel what she's feeling. It's not like somebody in Chinatown grabbing a sword off the wall and being, oh, this is a badass. I'm going to put this in. I'm going to hang this in my studio. I'm going right. to hang this in my bedroom. You know what I mean? It's like, this is a part, this is like an appendage. And this is like, what it's like, and she's handling this instrument of like, this is the most, be this is the Ferrari, dude. Like, this is like the Lamborghini. Like, this is the ultimate in you know the ultimate sword like this there's no other brand name this is a priceless relic this is everything and i it's my favorite scene in the movie i i love the earlier thing with the bickering with the with with hanzo and his uh his assistant or his partner or whatever whoever that is and i love the whole attic scene and then it turns into the ritual of like him you know christening the sword and giving it to her and bestowing it upon her you know yellow you know yellow haired warrior you're like set dispatching her and the fact of like also like you're so happy for the bride because you know her mentor betrayed her and now she's got this fucking mentor like now it's like and part of it is that like is sort of hanzo and his repentance because he created, he helped create this monster and he knows it. So now he's sending her into the world with something that he promised he would never do again in order to play his part. You know what I mean? In order to like, and you realize this is a great man and like she's got this, now she's got this great mentor, you know? It's just like, and the mystique because you never see him again. And, you know, you want more and he give, they give you just enough. They give you just a taste of this iconic character, this legendary Hattori Hanzo character. And you feel like, wow, is this like an Iga clan descendant of like, is this like, a, is this the real thing? This is crazy. Like, how do you incorporate, how do you write this and incorporate that and make it work and make it like resonate like it resonates? Like I get so excited about this scene. Like it's, it's my favorite and, and there's some, there's some great stuff in volume two as well but i feel like this is my favorite bit in both you know in all four hours this is my favorite bit for sure and as far as the the scene at the end i mean i'm, I'm curious what do you make of the yakuza I'm, i've always been very interested in this group the mm. japanese underworld has always been really fascinating to me because japan is a very low crime society now they argue you are there's arguments that especially sexual crime and stuff is just not reported very much there. Um, right. Culture of disbelief and all of that. But generally speaking, Japan is known of, as being incredibly safe. And 
it's always fascinating that some of the most notorious underworld criminals in the world, when you think about it, hail from Japan, whether or not they've earned that title. I imagine maybe they have, maybe they haven't. I have no clue. But what do you make about the who's why are we interested in the Japanese underworld? I think it's interesting, Kyle, when you think about crime syndicates or the underworld in the East as opposed to the West. I don't know if it's like notoriously less flashy than, say, the American mafia, right? I think the Russian mafia is another interesting conversation, but I think it doesn't really play into either one. I think every each, as far as I know, and I have very limited knowledge, obviously, but I think each underworld in each part of the world is very distinctive unto itself. It seems they all seem a little different. Like Russian organized crime seems like it's uh, to me, it always seemed like from what I heard or what I read. And again, I have very limited knowledge, but it always seemed very tied in with the government where Italian, you know, you have the traditional Italian, the, you know, the black hand dating back to Sicily and all that kind of stuff. It almost, uh, and maybe this is media and movies and TV, especially playing into it, but it always seemed like more like, flashy um you know like um a little more demonstrative uh, out in the open show offy you know oh and the and the and the bling oh. and the houses and the yeah. what you know the 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 gumars and all this kind of stuff <laughs> where yeah. japanese yakuza you hear of it but it always seemed to me like something like if they're dealing in sex traffic, if they're dealing in prostitution, if they're dealing in drugs, whatever black market retail, whatever, like that type of thing, um, just overt, um, theft, whatever it is, like it always seemed like it was something that really operated in like what you would consider like a ninjutsu type of way, like the art of, you know, disappearing, the art of like invisibility. Like it always seemed tied in with that. Like it was much more shadowy, much more sneaky, much less flashy, just something going on, a true underworld thing, like something going on beneath the surface, a, 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 a culture underneath the culture that was purposely, you know, that was profitable, but purposely hidden from sight. And, you know, maybe I'm wrong about that, but what's so crazy about the representation of the Yakuza in Tarantino's film and Kill Bill is that it is this like almost Italian mafia esque Western Godfather Goodfellas Sopranos type thing where it's like this overt thing where they they move as a posse they enter restaurants together they throw their weight around they're dressed in these very distinctive black suits they drive these motorcycles and escort this very um, flashy Mercedes uh, executive car around and they have swords in the back of their bikes like you know what i mean it's it's a very anime very um showy colorful representation of something that's known to be mysterious and uh that's very interesting to me it's a very stylized depiction of the yakuza and i think the other thing too is like we don't really have that many i feel like there's that not that many yakuza based there's not that many things about the yakuza you had the video games right or video game is it one video no game? no this is a whole series it's a franchise. Yeah. And you have, you know, Western movies here and there that like, that go into that, but they're very few and far between. I feel like it's still very much a mysterious thing. It's almost like we talk about with World War One. It's like, why aren't there more things about this? This is really interesting. You know, it's e even exploring like feudal Japan, I feel like, sure. or ninjutsu, the, the history of the legacy of like ninjutsu. Like it's very, it's not. It's always very stylized. It's never like a true life representation of that thing. So maybe it has that going on too. But I like the way it plays into that sort of like, you know, these are the guys that rule Tokyo and like everybody knows it. You know what I mean? They they ride around demonstrating that daily. Like they they're they're the force to be reckoned with. They're the and they they don't have to hide. They they're right out in plain sight, which makes them makes them appropriately badass. And I think with Lucy Liu, too, it's important to say, we kind of skipped over this. I didn't mean to. Her casting is so good in this because obviously she's Asian. She's supposed to be half a, uh, Chinese and half Japanese. And she has that exotic look to her, Lucy Liu. Like she has, you know, those really cool freckles. Like she's obviously gorgeous. And I love, the, I love by the way, like her uh, inclusion and in Curb Your Enthusiasm as playing herself. That was so cool. 
But you know, she's she's a great one for this part because she feels like she could be Chinese, she could be a Westerner. And I love that she takes exception to calling in her, you know, calling in the Chinese and English ties. You know what I mean? Like she's she's got this elegance. She has that one style of sword. She's got this whole lady snowblood type thing. But you know what I mean? She's got that she's got that really like vi- that violence underneath the surface. Like she's a dangerous person. And, uh, but she has that elegant front, you know, almost moves like a geisha, you know what I mean? Very, very poised and postured and all that kind of stuff. Um, super cool casting. I mean, I think all the casting is cool. Ju- Julie Dreyfus too, like great casting. You know, sh- she has real J- Japan ties in real life. So you kind of buy that from her awesome bit of casting. I feel like Tarantino's casting is always good. But um, yeah, dude, the the Yakuza in this is so cool. And we'll see a little bit more of that. And, you know, the whole thing with like the crazy 88 and having like a a name for themselves. And, you know, it's it's interesting to me. Um, Did you ever hear PJ's story with the Yakuza? PJ has this friend of his, this guy, Jesse, who lived in Japan for a long time. And he talks about seeing the Yakuza guys move around like, down in certain sections of Tokyo and the arcades and stuff like that. And the the way they would just be like normal dudes, like, I don't know what the identifier was physically, but you just knew who they were. Maybe it's that they moved in groups. Maybe they were dressed really natty and like nice suits or whatever, like um, tailored suits or whatever, but they would just be acting like regular dudes, like playing games and drinking and stuff like that. And then they, they wouldn't necessarily be trying to hide their identity, but they would just be blending in with everybody. But I guess anybody in the know knew who they were, which is always fascinating to me. It's another thing of like, wow, I'd love to go to Japan and just see that from afar. Like, yeah, as I as I recall, like I remember trying to or researching visiting a Shinto shrine when I was there once. Yeah. And you can, but I didn't want to disrespect them because they prefer that people with... I didn't think they want people with tattoos at Shinto shrines. And I think oh, part of the reason why is because oh, that's right. it's an identifier of the Yakuza there. That's is, right. That's yeah. what I've always heard. Yeah. Is like the who's aware of their tattoos. And I guess that's kind of maybe an old fashioned thing now, but was that's how you knew back in the day. Now, do they have certain tattoos? Are there certain marks or is it just like, I don't know. Tattoo? I don't know nearly enough. You know, I mean, people love that Yakuza series from Ryu Gakoshu or whatever they're called. Uh, the studio from um, from Sega. They actually just lost this. The studio leads to another team, but. The is that French. an ongoing series or they have put that to bed now? No, no, it's ongoing. It's it's okay. more popular than ever. Um, wow, that's cool. 15 years on, I think now, starting on the PlayStation 2. I wanted to briefly touch on the character Gogo, who I mentioned earlier, the bodyguard character, really smitten with this character because I feel like she's pulled straight out of like Persona or some video game series. Oh, dude. And Absolutely. Just everything about her. Killer look. I love I love the flashback with her and the old man at the bar, like we said. I love that she returns with some sort of morning star type mace that I'm like, where did you get this thing? And you were talking about the violence like that scene to me is the most tense because like the idea of crushing, getting crushed with that sort of thing, like when it hits her in the back of her own head, it's like, oh, oh man. man, like um, and so I, I really liked that. And, and I thought that the, one of the most visceral scenes in the entire movie was when she's strangling Uma Thurman with it. And she's, oh. it's awesome. She's like wrapping the chain around her body and like spinning slowly towards her to like just increase the tension. You it's think really, she's done. You yeah, really do. It's you quite think, the you ballet. It's finished. What did you think about this, this character? I really like this character. It's too bad that she had to go. Dude, this is character design 101. Right, right? You have this Yakuza baddie, this Yakuza boss in Oren Ishii. Who's going to be her... Her like right lieutenant, who's going to be her bodyguard? It's got, got to be this massive dude, right? It's got to be like this incredible Hulk type. No, it's this seventeen-year-old schoolgirl that uses this really unique weapon that has a strength. And you know, she's on the surface, she's like this giggling, shy Japanese schoolgirl. And there's this fucking monster underneath, dude. She's like one of the most dangerous people. She guards. She's the bodyguard of one of the most dangerous women in the world, right? And you put that in the package of like a 17, this slight of build 17 year old Japanese schoolgirl. It's fucking ingenious. I mean, this is like, this is how you tell a story. This is how you create a character. And knowing, like, seeing her for a while before you even get to see her in action, you're like, what is this chick capable of? And like, even like the exchange before the fight with the bride and Gogo, and the bride's like, our reputations precede us, like trying to talk her out of it. Like, the bride knows knows damn well who she is. 
they know who each other and they know you know this is going to be this epic battle and you're right that mace that bladed mace dude that thing feels heavy first of all you got this chain weapon you got to keep it moving, around. which is cool. You got to keep. I was talking to that with Mike. I'm like, to use it, you got to like keep it moving. You can't stop moving, which is really cool. yeah. You're fighting you know? somebody with a sword. Yeah, you know, like one of the most dangerous people in the world with a sword. And you got all this about momentum. You know, unwieldy. Like, it's unbelievable, yeah. dude. Yeah, it's cool. So good, dude. And the bride would have been finished if that table wasn't broken right there, right? Like she would have been. That would have been the end of her. Indeed. So Indeed. good, dude. I mean, it's just again, it's like probably as far as designing a character and making it visually interesting and making it like a proper surprise, like a character should be like, that's, she's probably top of the charts for Kill Bill. Like Gogo is just, and she's iconic. You know, you have uh, Bill, you have um, the yellow jumpsuit, you have like the katana, you have some stuff in the second one. Gogo is like one of the Kill Bill icons. She's on that. She's just one of the silhouettes on that poster. You know what I mean? Like she's, she's like, you know, and of course, like, referencing like classic movies like battle royale and stuff like that but like what she was pulled straight from but again tying in those those influences but also making it feel distinctly japanese you know what i mean this is a this is a world that's rooted out of asian countries you know later on we'll see pai mei we'll meet pai mei in volume two and we'll see the chinese connection but this whole world springs from the east and you want to make it as Japanese as possible in this case, this is how you do it. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's storytelling one-on-one, man. It's so, f- not only is it fun, but it just works. Yeah, I totally agree. And as we get towards the crescendo at the end, we see that beautiful blue silhouette scene of everyone fighting, which is probably my va- favorite visual flair in the whole film. I love that. Reminds me a little bit of that scene in The Last Jedi, uh, the throne room scene, actually. Oh, Compl- yeah, Complimentary does. of that scene. But then, of course, Lucy Liu is scalped in the snow, and we're left to wonder... Where we go from here now, you know, and I don't. So it's exciting to I'm going to be watching this in the coming days as we record the next episode. So I'm really excited for you to see yeah, it. It's I'm very excited. Good. To, I'm excited about it as well. Your your instrument is quite impressive. That's <laughs> the only other thing I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yeah, Dave, that's, uh, do you have anything else you wanted to say before we wrap it up? You know, what? it's exciting. I just I wanted to see if Tarantino was kind of staying true to that thing of being like 10 and out, like he's going to do his 10th movie, the one after once upon a time in Hollywood. And then he was going to jet. And he's the whole idea behind that, like not jumping the shark and leave them wanting more. I think that's, you know, we talk about that a lot, uh, pretty often on the show. And that's the idea behind that. And he talked about it about a half a year ago with Rogan and he's maintaining that, but the exciting thing in having this conversation, and he's still talking about his 10th movie being Kill Bill 3. And you talked about this scene before, Kyle. I don't know if you knew this, but the idea behind where he would like to take Kill Bill 3 is for Vanita Green's daughter, the Nikki character, to come back and avenge her, her mother's death, which we see early in Kill Bill. That'd be awesome. Month, I like that. Yeah. And that whole thing of like having, he talks about having Maya Hawk. Who plays Robin in Stranger Things? He's she's Uma Thurman and Ethan Hawke's daughter, playing a little. Um, what is her name? I don't even um, know. Let me see. BB, BB, B, little BB, the bride's daughter, the bride and Bill's daughter, and you know, having like a twenty-one-year-old BB and the bride on the run from Nikki. I think she was saying like I think Tarantino was kind of toying with the idea of like bringing L Driver. Was it L Drive? Was it L Drive? No, I think the uh, Sophie Fatale character as kind of like the mentor, and her and Nikki sort of going after the bride and her daughter as like an, an, an act of revenge. And how cool would that be to go out for him to go out by doing a trilogy? Yeah, you know what would, I mean? by making pretty... like the the you know by basically bringing the story to a close. It'd be super super cool, man. I would love that. I was thinking that it would be cool for him to, since he's such a an ensemble director he likes reusing actors it was to just gather everyone in the last movie there you go which yeah. i think would be cool whatever it was like to make sure you get all the people you're identified with your john travolta and your uma thurman you know like, see that would be cool and, and brad pitt and i like, just get every, every like, it would be cool you know to just go through that line and and pick up some people along the way that you've used time and time again samuel L. jackson vivica fox it would be cool to like get all of them involved in like the final project in some cumulative way. He's so way. good at like 
you know, that's what we talked about in the mid nineties. I was like the, the, on the tip of our tongues, like, wow, this guy is going to pull actors and actresses out of obscurity and like give them a second lease on their careers. And like, I was watching some Pulp Fiction scenes the other day. It was so clever with that. Not only were you taking a great actor and John Travolta, an iconic actor, right? From the seventies and John Travolta and putting him back in the spotlight, but here you are making him dance again. Like it's fucking it's brilliant. Like, yeah, not only are you going to put John, bring John Travolta back, but you're going to make him dance, which is what he was known for. It's like, that's just the kind of clever shit that no one else was doing. You know what I mean? And, and you made it work. Definitely. So, you know, like with, Iconic. with, with Kill, I mean, it's, he's so good at that. He's so good at a, at a lot of things I feel like, but with, with Kill Bill, it was just a treat. It was just really a treat to go back and see it again. And, um, what else did I want to say about it? Just really like, it's one of the great swordplay movies too. Like that that final battle in the House of Blue Leaves, where we see the bride really get her revenge on Oren and her entourage. There's some really iconic shit in there. Like that aerial shot of like she's surrounded by like fifty dudes and she just raises her sword a little bit and they all go back. Like just stuff like that is what makes it memorable. Like makes it really joyous. It's like. As somebody who who really appreciates filmmaking, it's like those are the little touchstones, the little Tarantino's touchstones that make it special. And yeah, dude, I'm so excited for you to see volume two because you know what you get in volume two that you didn't get as much in volume one? Dialogue. You get a lot more of that really awesome Tarantino dialogue and character. You know, those exchanges between characters where it's not even, even there is there's some great set piece fighting and stuff like that but you get and there's a there's a great one actually that i just remembered in volume two but you get a lot of that you know you get a lot of that conversation you get a lot of that great writing so and we're talking about it soon so i'm really excited for that me too that's next up on our list so um yeah that was a fun conversation glad we watched it on to volume two shortly Dagan, as we always do with knockback let's end this episode with a dad joke all right i got one here from james Now, James was a little surprised I hadn't used this one already because it's really one that he feels like Colin would appreciate. I agree. Okay. So James, via Twitter, I don't think I ever shared this one, but remind me if I did. Kyle, this is a G.I. Joe joke for you. What happens to Cobra Commander when he stays out in the sun too long? Mm, I don't know. He gets a Zartan. (laughs) <laughs> that's horrible that's a horrible one <laughs> james i was hoping he would like it i can't james i could tell the joke but i can't make him like no it. you can't you can lead a horse i'm to powerless water. well that was i appreciate that very obscure joke and uh pretty rough but we appreciate <laughs> we appreciate the effort nonetheless uh dig thank you so much for your love uh kindness and support of, of this show because i can really tell that you're putting in a lot of hours a lot of time and they get into the oh, all right. Fun. So we always thank the it's audience for the, love, for the love, kindness, and support. But thank you for the the attention you pay to the show. It's it, it, it isn't. I really this is a, the highlight. It's really not. This is a highlight for me. Um, so uh, thank you, Dig. Thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support of all things Last Stand Media and Knockback, Sacred Symbols, Defining Duke, all the rest. Come support us on uh, Patreon if you can. Buy merch, laststandmedia.shop. Find us on Discord, etc. and so on. We'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye. Knockback, a retro and nostalgia podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC, and is recorded from Central Virginia and the Philadelphia suburbs, USA. The show is conceived by and is produced by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is Dagan Moriarty. Knockback's executive producer is Dustin Furman, and the show is edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's shows, including Knockback, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer support level or higher on Patreon, and we're grateful for your kindness and generosity. 